Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Let the Sunshine, Digitizing Public Records. I'm Biz Gallo and joined by Claire Mambiella, uh, the Library Law Consultant. Um, Hi. Last, <laughs> hi. <laughs> uh, last week, it was Sunshine Week, which is celebrating um, open government, readily accessible public records, and access to public information. I think most of us on this call are public servants, and we understand the value of ensuring access to this public information. So today, Claire and I are going to talk a little bit about public records, what they are, and how you can increase access to them through digitization. Um, First, we are gonna go over just a little bit of housekeeping so everyone's on the same page. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to review it again later. It'll be posted in our on our YouTube page in about a week um, once it has been captioned. Um, there will be time for Q&A at the end, so feel free to um, hold on to your questions until then, or you can drop them in the chat throughout and we'll address them then. Um, if you have any technical or audio issues, feel free to reach out to Becky in the chat. She can help you resolve those. And um, last, there are a ton of additional resources in the resource section of the slides, which you will receive a copy of after the webinar today. So you don't have to worry about trying to scribble everything down. Um, you'll get a copy of everything. Do you want to make sure Claire can do her disclaimer on <laughs> everything we're going to say today? <laughs> yep. So this is just uh, my typical disclaimer. It just says that if uh, uh, I, even though I have a law degree, I'm not your lawyer. Um, so if you see yourself in any of the things we say in this presentation not to do, um, you may want to contact your library's attorney uh, to clarify things and make sure you're on the right track. If you do not have an attorney for your library. Um, I keep a list of attorneys in the state that work with libraries and I'd be happy to share it. Just shoot me an email. Uh, so today, Claire and I just give you a roadmap of today. We're going to be talking about you know, Public Records 101, what they are, what your responsibilities are for them, what legal considerations are regarding public records, and then digitizing public records. But before we do that, I always like to start with a little poll. So, um, you know, obviously we're going to be talking a lot about these today, but I'm assuming you came with some ideas or preconceived notions about what you might be interested in digitizing from your public records. So feel free to uh, drop in the chat what you're most interested in learning about or concerned about when it comes to digitizing public records. You're going to learn? That's great. Well, good. Then we're, I think we're really starting at a foundational place. Best practices um, for board minutes. Okay. Board minutes, yeah. Yep, lots of library board minutes, agendas. We all have a lot of those in our records. Mm -hmm. Well, great. I think we're really going to hit a lot of the foundational points of public records and, and what they are. So if you have specific questions, we can always address those at the end. But otherwise, I am, oh, everything on for records retention schedule. Yep, we'll be talking about that. Okay, well, then I am going to hand it off to Claire, and we'll dive right in. All righty. So, okay, uh, you can go to the next one, please, Biz. So we're going to start with what is a public record? Well, in the statute, uh, so in the... Um, the uh, FOIA in the uh, Freedom of Information Act, which is the act that connects to public records. Um, so a public record says that it's a writing prepared, owned, used in the possession of or retained by a public body in the performance of an official function. So I highlighted those words because those are kind of the meat of a public record. Essentially, of course, as the years have gone on and technology has changed, it, it isn't necessarily just a writing anymore. Um, you know, it's been recognized that it, you know, recordings and video and um, it could be artwork. I mean, there's drawings, all kinds of things that could be a, a public record. What's important is that it's a public record that was either created by a government entity, used by a government entity, or something that they have in their possession um, 
that they have acquired or used as part of what they do, their duties, um, part of what their purpose is. So if if you have a, um, a, a, a well, like, for example, Treasury receives a lot of information and reports from other entities. Just because they get that information from other entities doesn't mean that those things they receive are not public records. OK, we're going to go over that a little bit more in a minute. So within um, the Freedom of Information Act, um, there are two different categories of public records. One are, is public records that are exempted from uh, having to give up to the members of the public. Uh, the other one is everything else. <laughs> so it's kind of like the records you don't have to give and the records you have to give. So not really clear, but we're going to go over uh, exemptions. If you could progress the slide, please. So how do you know, how do you identify a public record given that these um, definitions sometimes are not necessarily super clear? So there are, in what I've experienced is there's kind of two things to look at when you're identifying public records. There's our obvious public records, right? So, you know, public records are going to be, you know, of course, from a library's perspective, um, your budget, uh, your policies, your public meeting minutes, you know, um, the signage you post, all the handouts you may give, um, this public, this uh, presentation, for example, like that's, those are kind of obvious public records. But then you also have public records that might be, there are things you use and you create as part of your duties, but sometimes you think, huh, are these really public records? So sometimes that could be things like salary schedules or employee um, uh, evaluations, or it could be uh, notes that um, people write to themselves when you're in a meeting, like are all of these public records? So what you really wanna keep in mind when you're evaluating whether something's a public record or not, that if you don't have a statute or something that tells you this is a public record you have to keep, what you want to look at is whether the information is something that is used to complete part of your mission, right? So records you use to, um, you know, operate the library, you know, your facilities records, your budget, your uh, employee uh, policies and records, you know, all of those kinds of things. And then once you get those segregated into, okay, we believe all of these are public records, and then you look at, okay, which one of these records can we just give out to the public and which of these records or portions of these records are things that we have to keep private. Okay, Biz, would you go? I keep trying to advance the slides. <laughs> So one of the things also that helps us determine this are retention schedules. Now, obviously this is a presentation that we have a brief amount of time to explain this stuff. So there's a lot more information here. I could give you about all of these things. So this is kind of the bare minimum. Um, so essentially all of you uh, may have seen the retention schedules that are posted on uh, the Department of Management and Budget, uh, what is it? It's uh, technology management and budget here at the state. Um, and they have all of the lists that tell you all of the different documents that, for example, they have public libraries have to keep and how long you have to keep it. And you may wonder, where does that come from? Who decides what has to be kept and how long it has to be kept? Well, those decisions under the Management and Budget Act, uh, DTMB, or D Department of Technology Management and Budget, um, are tasked with creating those schedules. And they create those schedules in accordance with the agencies that work with those documents. So for example, the public library retention schedules were created in account with the Library of Michigan. And if um, updates need to be made, then we would look at that and update it. And, and I actually believe updates do need to be made, but that's a whole other webinar. <laughs> um, so DTMB takes into account all of the public records that are produced by that agency, and then also other laws that state, like financial laws um, and employment laws that require you to hold on to uh, certain documents for certain amounts of times, in addition to this general public records laws. 
So your schedules list how long you have to keep the records and what records you have to keep. The one thing I just want to remind you is that if by digitizing you're going to replace paper, you say, you know, I have all of these drawers of, of board meeting minutes and I just don't want to keep these anymore. Um, you can do that. Just what's, Im what's important is to remember that you have to keep, for example, um, board minute minutes forever, right? You can never throw those away. So if you're going to put that on to, um, uh, you know, digital, even if you're going to put just say only after 1960 or something digital, you have to remember that you have to keep those in ad finitum. So you have to make sure that your technology has the space and that you have the ability to maintain those uh, schedules and those documents on into the future. So that's something you have to plan for because you always have to make sure that you can provide access to those, uh, to the members of the public. Uh, Biz, would you keep going? Now, a lot of the, the laws and when you look at FOIA and the, um, the uh, records retention, um, a lot of them point to the state records. And so, you know, what gives the requirements that local governments have to keep records other than just the list from DTMB, right? Um, and the local government, um, you know, the, the laws that created DTMB actually fold in local governments, but so do laws on, um, there's a law that created and that uh, kind of uh, oversees the state archives. And that law actually says that any document that is created or held by a, a state office, including um, their political subdivisions, right? And so local governments are political subdivisions of the state. Um, they say they belong to the people of the state. They're, they don't belong to the government entity. They actually are owned by the people of the state. And so the state archives is the official repository for those records that are owned by the people. So that law kind of folds in the idea that local governments, including public libraries, have to maintain these records. And then in addition to that, FOIA and the Open Meetings Act also requires that all public entities provide access to materials. So if they provide access to materials, obviously that means they have to hold materials. Uh, you can go ahead and, and continue this. Thank you. So let's say, you know, okay, well, great. Now we know we're supposed to do this. What happens if we don't do it? Well, um, the Michigan Penal Code or the Criminal Code uh, has a provision that makes it a crime to destroy public records before the time that they're allowed to be destroyed in the records retention. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, right? Just because it's taking up space and just because no one has ever asked for it does not give you permission to destroy it if in fact the records retention says that you're supposed to hold on to it. Uh, Biz? So now we're gonna talk a little bit about some more specific legal considerations um, when you're thinking about digitizing public uh, records. So now that you have an idea of what public records are, um, let's talk about uh, some, you know, like I said, some specific, specific legal issues. So the Freedom of Information Act is the big one. So the Freedom of Information Act, as I said, partners hand in hand with the laws on, on maintaining public records. Um, the purpose of the Freedom of Information Act is to foster government transparency accountability by making it so members of the public have access to documents that the government has. Um, and essentially it ties into our constitutional right to information. So public entities have to supply access to all public records upon request. FOIA sets specific deadlines and some specific procedures of how the entity complies with that. Um, it also exempts certain documents from access. In other words, it, it, it permits certain information to remain private. Now at the federal level, that would be things like classified information. At the state level, under our State Freedom of Information Act, um, there are very specific criteria that covers whether or not something is exempt. Uh, would you, next slide. Um, and we're, so we're gonna get up more into the, the exemption. So hold on a second. Um, so when you're looking at digitization and you're looking at um, the Freedom of Information Act, um, there are pros and cons, right? 
to, to digitizing and FOIA compliance, right? So does digitization help FOIA or do, is digitization make FOIA more complicated? So under PRO, right, digitizing documents that have to be FOIA can save a lot of staff time, right? So for example, you digitize your board meeting minutes and now if someone requests them, instead of having to pull them and copy them or scan them, you can just point to the website and tell the member of the public, you can go pull them yourself from the website. And that is perfectly fine under FOIA. Um, it, it, the problem, you know, it, it, can it can result or sorry it can involve a lot of kind of some upfront work but long term um it can it can result in having savings of uh space of staff time um of um of you know having to copy something uh every time and mail it out every time someone sends you a, a notice it saves you know if you have a FOIA administrator it saves that FOIA administrator time um the other thing to consider under FOIA when you're looking at digitization uh is that not everything you digitize so you know a lot of times we just assume that digitization and public access go hand in hand right but if you're going to digitize your public documents, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to make them forward facing to the public. Right here at here in the Library of Michigan, we just sent out, thanks to Biz, um, all of our library files. So all of our files that we have on every library in the state that include their establishment information, their contracts, all of that, we just sent all those out to be digitized. And the purpose of that is so that we have an in-house, um, at least initially, it's so that we have an in-house uh, way to access those documents because we're not always in the office. And if someone asks us for their establishment documents, it makes it much easier to be able to pull them from a digital repository and send them to somebody than to have to contact, oh, who's in the office today? Can you pull these documents? Do you know which documents to pull that proves a in, uh, establishment. So you may have documents like that as well, whether they're, you know, personnel files, uh, whether they're budgetary files that, you know, you're not sure you want to make them all forward facing, or they're a mix of, of documents that are exempt from, from, uh, you know, uh, giving them out uh, and non-exempt. Um, and, you know, you want to be able to go through them. And if someone asks for them, be able to pick and redact you can do that by, you know, having them done in-house. So that's also a consideration with FOIA and it can make things much easier for you. The, the con side is that it's not always useful for all documents, right? Because some documents because of FOIA are gonna require heavy redaction. So some of the things that are exempt from FOIA are anything with um, personal identifying information. Uh, so personal addresses, personal phone numbers, um, you know, personal maiden names, your social security number, driver's license number, um, your uh, health insurance policy number, um, all of those things would be personal identifying information. So even though, for example, your benefits information is public record, the information that your staff have to fill out in order to belong or in order to get access to the health insurance information is not public record. So you may have documents that someone has filled out and that document is public record, but not their personal information. So you'd have to redact it. So if you have documents that require heavy redaction, that can be a little bit more difficult um, to have in a digital format, depending on the document. That's something that biz it can address uh, in a better way. Um, if your goal is maintaining an archive past disposal ability. So for example, you know, as libraries, a lot of times our goal is to maintain the information. It, we're not always as necessarily concerned with getting rid of information, right? So if your if your if your desire is to archive information, maybe you have um, cemetery records or um, you know some kind of information that you want to make available for a long period of time. Policies, right? You want to have like an archive of policies. 
Um, the only thing to keep in mind is that if you do not dispose of your documents according to the records retention schedule, then that document remains accessible through FOIA, even if the retention schedule says that you could have thrown it away. So, you know, for example, if you keep security footage um, past the seven day limit that you can dispose of it, that means that if a patron comes up and wants access to that security footage on day eight or nine, you can't turn them down based on the fact that, oh, well, we could have gotten rid of it. And you can't say, oh, we don't have it because you think, oh, well, we could have gotten rid of it. So we can just tell them we don't have it because we're not supposed to have it anyway. You can't do that either. The law says that if you have it, you have to give it up, even if it's something that normally you would have gotten rid of. The other thing is there may be documents that are advantageous to the agency to get rid of. Now, this is something to discuss with your lawyer, but many times from a liability standpoint um, and from you know certain liability strategy standpoint, there may be documents that you don't want to keep past the time you have to keep them. Some of those could be certain employment documents, um, certain uh, could be certain board documents that you don't have to keep you know, for the, forever, there's some you do, but not all of them. Um, you may want to get rid of those at the time you can, maybe even some financial documents. Um, so that's something to discuss with your lawyer. There are advantages to, to adhering to that disposal schedule. And those are things, again, that you have to discuss because it could differ from situation to situation. Um, and then you have to make sure that you have somebody in your on staff who keeps track of that and then, you know, disposes of the digitized material at the time that they're legally able to do so. Uh, Diz, would you move forward? Open Meetings Act. So like FOIA, the Open Meetings Act is kind of like its younger brother. Um, the Open Meetings Act is to foster governmental transparency, um, but instead of uh, access to information, it's to foster citizen participation. So where FOIA is more like looking at the results of governmental um, business documents, um, the OMA is more geared towards the in involving yourself within the process of government. Um, and so that all has to do with being able to participate and put your two cents in during meetings and seeing actually how the government works. Um, and so the Open Meetings Act requires public bodies, as many of you know, um, to make decision and conduct business of the government in a public meeting. The biggest piece of public record that is part of the Open Meetings Act is really the meeting minutes. Um, the meeting minutes um, the, the OMA specifically states what you have to put in your meetings, and it's pretty bare bones. Um, entities can put more information in the meetings, but again, that's something to kind of consider with your board because there's pluses and minuses to adding information to the meetings, right? Um, from an a, a attorney point of view, you may want to think, well, what could come back to bite me? if I put it in the meetings, if I don't have to. Um, but from a research standpoint and from a historical standpoint, you know, when I go back and look at meeting minutes, I'm always like, oh, I hope they put in reasons why they decided this. And very often they just put the vote because that's all they have to put. So those are some of the considerations, you know, to think about when you're looking at digitizing and you're looking at creating what should be in your minutes. Um, also, when you're looking at the Open Meetings Act, um, when you're in a public meeting, other documents that are part of that meeting, so the board packet. The board packet is a public document. Um, so that means that if someone requests it, they you have to give them access to it. The only things that you'd be able to not have in the board packet is, for example, uh, again, personally identifying information. Um, if there's a letter from their attorney, you know, because that's attorney client privilege, those kinds of things can be, you know, pulled out of the board packet. Uh, but you'd have to go through the packet and match it against these things in the law that are uh, exempted. Um, OK, would you but though anyway, those documents, you're going to want to make sure that you uh, make available if someone asks them for them. Now, do you want to digitize all your board packets and put them online? You could, but that's a decision that you'd, you'd have to make to decide whether or not you want to do that. Um, the pro side of, of, you know, how digitization affects the Open Meetings Act is it is 
pretty simple. It's it's not a lot of information generally because it's mainly your your minutes and your agendas if you have them. Um, it can save staff effort because usually what people are looking for are the minutes. Um, anytime you 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 um, add information, anytime you're transparent, you're uh, inspiring community trust, right? So you the one of the best ways your board and your library can inspire community trust, um, if you're heading towards a millage or if you're involved in in a con, con, kind of a controversy, is to push transparency, right? Because the more stuff you put online, your your community looks at that like, well, the less things they have to hide. You throw all your financial stuff online. Pff, well, gee, you know, all their financial stuff is on there. There's nothing, you know, they're, they're not trying to hide anything. Maybe they made a mistake, but they're not trying to hide anything. All your minute meetings, are your meeting minutes are up there. Well, they're not trying to hide anything. So that's a huge reason uh, to put stuff, to digitize stuff and to make them available. Um, also, like I said, public meetings don't usually have a lot, so it's not a huge load. Um, kind of the negative side, possibly, the negative implications for the OMA are that if you only digitize some things and not others, um, that could create an issue. So if you digitize all your meeting minutes and all your agendas, but you don't um, make available documents that were referenced within those meetings, like if they're talking about a study or a report, or they're talking about the budget, or they're talking about a new policy, um, if you don't make those available, then that can result in some problems. Um, you want to make sure that you have a good policy of what kind of materials you are going to digitize and what ones you aren't. Um, and if, you, if you're going to do it, maintain it. So if you're going to start putting your minutes on, you know, I've seen some pages where um, libraries or municipalities will start to post their minutes and then their minutes end like in 2021. And there's nothing after that. And maybe someone got busy. Maybe there was a staffing change. But if you don't continue it, then that sends the opposite message to your community. Because the first thing that you think is, what happened? Now I really want those minutes. Because maybe there's something good in there if they're not there. So you want to make sure that once you start it, you, you continue it. If you record your meetings um, in a like digitally, right? So if you put them on Facebook or or if you record them in an audio format, um, there's an exception in the Open Meetings Act that says if you're recording the meetings so that the person who takes your minutes has a reference to look at them and review them, then you don't have to keep that recording. If the recording was made for purposes of the minutes and you have written minutes, then you don't have to keep the recording. However, if a recording was made for another reason um, and, and, and or you hold on to a recording that you could have gotten rid of, then you do have to give access to that recording. Um, any member of the public, anybody attending that meeting, including individual board members, can record the meeting without notice, without permission, and they can post it on a Facebook page or anywhere else. The difficult thing comes is if you have a board member who records and posts on social media before the minutes come out, then you know, there, there's some stickiness there because did the person post as a board member or did they post as a member of the general public? And that situation can get a little sticky and it can be situational. So that's something that you may need to discuss with your attorney whether or not you need to hold on to that. Um, would you continue, please? Privacy. Um, as we mentioned, some information that is collected by public entities is not appropriate for full public access and is exempted from all of the laws. Um, essentially, if the information is protected by another law, so HIPAA, FERPA, um, the ADA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, FERPA is the, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which is the School um, Privacy Act, the Library Privacy Act. So if the, you know, attorney client privilege, if the information is protected under either the OMA, the Open Meetings Act or FOIA or some other law, then that's a very big hint that that information should not be made available to the public and would have to be redacted. Anything with personally identifying information, again, personal names, not the names of staff, 
but their hut, their spouses, their kids, their home addresses, um, any kind of ID numbers, um, credit card numbers, bank information, anything like that needs to be redacted and cannot be posted to the to the um, the you know if you're uh, your digital project. Um, ADA accommodation requests, all of these things, even if you have a um, request for reconsideration, uh, you'd have to redact the name and the address and contact information of the patron who made that request. Uh, so that's under the Library Privacy Act. So you have to kind of keep in mind all of those um, things when you're looking at public documents that actually include people's names or that kind of information. Um, that's why before releasing any information that has any kind of personal information in it or that you think could possibly come under one of these laws, you want to check with your attorney. Um, and that includes older documents too. Now there are exceptions for, you know, once someone dies, all their personal information is completely open. But there is an exception, you know, for schools. If you're digitizing yearbooks, there are some exceptions there. You can't just take a yearbook and digitize it. Um, there are, especially recent ones, there are some things that you have to look at regarding FERPA and what they call directory information. Uh, and if you want more information about that, I have it and I'd be happy to send it to you. But those are just things to know. Uh, Biz, you keep going. Um, Identity theft protection. Um, so security, you um, the only real law Michigan has that protects your personal information and like cyber theft is the Identity Theft Protection Act. It comes down very hard on businesses that collect personal information. Libraries are covered by the Library Privacy Act, which makes us very aware of this, but you want if you if you in your library if you're looking at again digitizing information that could have impacts to this you want to absolutely make sure that whatever you're doing is not only compliant with the library privacy act but with the identity theft protection act also you want to be aware of cyber security right now across the country states are passing laws um, on you know, requiring certain levels of cybersecurity and data security. Michigan actually has a bill in the pipeline that would significantly, um, you know, kind of, uh, it's a lot stronger than the Identity Theft Protection Act in terms of requiring protections for cybersecurity and the prevention of identity theft. So, those are the kinds of things you want to keep your eye on because it could change your project uh, from a technical standpoint because of some of the requirements uh, that are placed within the platforms you have to have uh, and, you know, certain technical things. So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, you can go ahead. This. Uh, accessibility. Again, this is something that is right now on the forefront. Um, the uh, Department of Justice and their Civil Rights Department, which is responsible for the enforcement of the ADA, right now their hot button thing is digital accessibility. Um, so websites, digital products, um, the Department of Justice is really invested in making sure that these uh, electronic materials are accessible to people with disabilities. Title II of the Disabilities Act concerns local and state governments and the ability and the access to programs and services for people with disabilities. So in order to be compliant with Title II, your website and your digital activities have to be accessible to people with disabilities. So that includes compliance with WCAG 2.1, which is a web accessibility. Um, right now, there is a um, there's a proposed rule going through uh, that would make it uh, a requirement to adhere to certain specific standards with your web uh, and your digital um, projects. So that is something um, that you're going to want to keep an eye on because if that um, if that uh, rule goes through, uh, you'll have to be compliant with it. And I did uh, post that link at the end in the resources. Again, if your aim is to replace paper, okay, 
one of the things you really have to consider in addition to all the other things you have to consider is if you're replacing paper, you have to make sure that people with disabilities are going to be able to have access to that information because they're members of the community too. And if, if, if digitizing and throwing away the paper means you're not going to be able to accommodate somebody with a disability, then you really have to think about, you know, how are you going to accommodate someone with a disability in order to have access to this information? You know, you can print it off. There's lots of things you can do, but you have to make sure that you've thought of that and that you have a, a procedure. Uh, so that's something to think about. Uh, go ahead, Biz, last, the, I think it's last one. Yep. Copyright and trademark. Um, so when you look at public documents, everybody thinks public documents are government documents, right? They're free, public domain, right? Um, not necessarily. Believe it or not, government bodies can trademark some of their materials. Here in Michigan, a lot of the material that is trademarked are things like the Michigan Register, which is uh, a part of the regulatory process, the Michigan Statutes, which is our um, printed and our uh, uh, compilation of the statutes. Some legislative documents are trade are copywritten. So, you know, if an agency has a mascot or something, it may be trademarked. All of the schools, so all of the public universities have, you know, uh, sports or other kind of mascots and that are trademarked. Their team names are trademarked. So you have to be careful about some of these documents. Uh, so they should have a copyright symbol on them. Um, and that gives you a good indication of whether they're, they're copywritten. The website of the entity should have some information on it regarding the copyright of their materials. Um, and usually it's at the bottom and at least either say copyright or use or something like that. And you would be able to read and find out what proper use is. It still would be under fair use, um, but it's something you're going to want to look at and consider if you're considering um, digitizing a big, like recently a library digitized all of those you, uh, Michigan Supreme Court briefs. So that's a copywritten set. So they had to get permission from the state of Michigan to do that. So those are some things that, you know, you're going to want just to be aware of. Just because it's government documents doesn't necessarily mean it's all free for the taking. Um, also, if you digitize a protected work, um, it can create a derivative work under the copyright law. So if something is protected by copyright, by digitizing it, now you're creating kind of another product um, that normally the rights holder would have access to, and that can also affect uh, copyright. Um, so you just want to be careful and make sure that what you're, cop you're going to digitize, you have all of the copyright information ironed out. And if you have any questions, contact your attorney, or I'd be happy to share what information I have. And I think that's it for me, Biz. Great. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> That is a lot, and I am so glad to have you as a wonderful resource Aww. to help uh, make this a little bit simpler. <laughs> Back at uh, you. So now that you know we've discussed what public records are, your responsibilities surrounding them, um, both legal and otherwise, I'm going to cover actual digitization of the records if you choose to do that. Again, you know, Claire mentioned the Department of Technology Management and Budget, uh, DTMB. They are the ones who put out the standards and the standards and best practices that I'm going to be referring to in this portion of the presentation all come from them. They're all linked at the end of the um, at the end of the slides in our resources section. So don't worry, those are there. There we go. So, you know, kind of talking about why you should digitize records. Um, you know, Claire talked about a lot of these reasons. First and foremost, digitization just enables access to these records. You know, in today's world, users really expect the sort of instantaneous access to information. Um, you know, it's fast, it's widespread, and digital content is available to anyone in the world that has a you know an internet connection and a computer which I do realize is not everybody but it is much more accessible than a piece of paper in a filing cabinet in a basement across town um, you know obviously those documents are still accessible eventually people are welcome to put in requests for them for these analog or not 
digital records, um, it just takes a lot more work to get that information than it would if you had already had these items digitized. Um, you know, so talking about enabling access, it also improves access. Uh, you know, these sorts of records can be pulled up with a matter of keystrokes rather than all of the physical labor that goes into getting an analog record. Um, obviously, you would still need to do those at some point to digitize them, but that work is done for you then going forward. Um, and really, not only does it improve and enable access to these records, it helps make them accessible. So, you know, Claire talked a lot about accessibility and ADA requirements. Um, digitization is just such a great way to make these materials accessible. It oftentimes requires additional steps like running optical character recognition or transcription, but it is huge. It's a huge game changer for those with disabilities, um, you know, using screen reader technologies for blind users or users with low vision can be just life-changing. Um, if it's a recording, it's an audio or video recording, subtitled text files can be used to make those accessible to either deaf or hard of hearing users. Um, and not only to users with disabilities, but all of these accessibility technologies make discovering and accessing materials so much more um, simple. Like, you know, I, I use full text search all the time looking for what I'm looking for. Um, so it, it has benefits beyond accessibility. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about that digitization can reduce the need for physical storage of material. Um, that really will depend on whether it is for a replacement or for access, whether you can destroy or, uh, you know, uh, deaccession those records. Um, but room full of boxed records can be digitized down to a phone size hard drive. So there really is a space uh, consideration factor. Um, and we'll talk about digital storage later, but it can be it can be a big space saver or at least like a local space saver if you digitize them and then keep them off site so you don't have to have physical access to them. And then finally, uh, digitization allows for continued access to either deteriorating or obsolete records through preservation, reformatting, or digitization. So think about um, maybe some of your really old records that might be on brittle or yellowing paper. Um, you're still responsible for maintaining those even if they are deteriorating. Um, if you have uh, recordings that you want to keep or you need to keep for some reason that might be on VHS tapes or audio cassettes, you know, digitizing them can make them more accessible. So there's a ton of reasons to digitize, um, you know, most of which have lifted on the left. That does not mean that it is a cure-all. You know, Claire talked a lot about the uh, pros and cons of digitization um, and a lot of those related to uh, legal cons or uh, responsibility cons, but there are some the drawbacks to digital records that people should be aware of before they jump into a digitization project. So there's sort of this idea that, oh, once you digitize it, you're good, you're done. It's digital and you have that file and you're ready to go. Um, but digital records are machine dependent. You know, they're dependent on hardware and software for you to access them. Um, you might need to update your software or your file types over the years. Um, consider the fact that you have these filing cabinets full of paper documents that you could pull out a drawer and you know your establishment records from the 1940s, you can probably still access. If you put a text file on a computer and you came back to that 20 years later, you would probably have a really hard time accessing that digitized document of the same material if you didn't take steps to ensure access over time. So there is an ongoing need to um, maintain those files. Uh, it also um, requires a level of expertise, a certain level of expertise to not only do the actual digitization work, but all of the work that then goes into describing and organizing and preserving those records so that they are accessible, not only to the public, but to you and your staff so you can find what you're looking for and manage them over time. Um, there is also an increased opportunity for corruption of that record. Um, digital material is very fragile when considered, uh, you know, when contrasted with uh, physical material, you know, and if a newspaper yellows or a photograph curls, stuff like that, 
we can still get the gist of that document or, or gather information from it. Uh, in digital, it's not, it's not that, um, it's not that strong. So if a single bit gets corrupted in a digital file, that can make the entire file inaccessible. So it really requires some bit level attention. Um, again, this doesn't mean you shouldn't digitize your records. I obviously am a big proponent of digital access to things. The reason we're here today is to talk about how digitizing public records can help increase access to your records, um, you know, build that transparency and that relationship with your public and your patrons. But it's important to consider all of the factors before you jump into a digitization project. Um, so some records might be worth digitizing more than others as you make this uh, decision. Uh, consider records that you might only need in the short term. So these are things that have, you know, they're usually large quantities of, um, they uh, they're in decentralized environments. They have high retrieval levels. They might be stored in areas, you know, spread out areas. Um, and you might not have to keep them forever. These are things with shorter retention periods or retention schedules so that, yes, you want to keep them. It'd be great if they were digital because you access them so often, but you don't have to keep them forever. And so these might benefit from some digital access, but without all the additional um, digital preservation uh, steps that would go into something like this, where you might need long-term access. So these are things that you need to keep um, in perpetuity that you would have, you know, your board minutes, the things that Claire talked about earlier. Um, these are also often uh, records that are large in quantity, have high retrieval records, decentralized storage, lots of users, but you need to keep these forever. And, um, if you do digitize them as a replacement, then you really need to consider a lot of the digital preservation components of a digitization as replacement versus digitization for access. Um, you know, examples of this would be HR records, establishment records, and board minutes and agendas. Um, that's a lot of options. We all have tons and tons of public records in our um, in our office environments, and it can be really hard to know where to start. I always like to pick the low hanging fruit. It just makes things easier when you're starting with something either simple or accessible. Um, obviously, that's the whole reason to digitize things is to make things simple and accessible. Um, but I would start with, you know, frequently requested records for access. So if people constantly are asking you for your board meeting minutes, that sounds like a good place to start. If people are asking you for a specific document or document type, that's sort of a flag for what either your staff or your, your users are most interested in getting their hands on. So you can be proactive about getting these frequently requested documents available digitally. Uh, if you don't have anything like that, uh, you could start with records that are difficult to access in their current state. Like this could be due to their location. Like, oh, whenever we get rec requests for that, we have to trek all the way to the storage facility or something like that. Um, you could also think about blueprints or maps or other kind of large, awkward material um, that's difficult to handle. And so having a digital surrogate for those materials would really uh, reduce a lot of barriers to access. Again, if neither of those seem like things you either have in your collection or you know, can think of right away, I always, coming from AV myself, I always like to think about the at-risk materials. So a lot of paper formats or analog formats, even if they are less susceptible to deterioration than, than digital copies, there are some that are very susceptible. So think about things like fax paper, carbon paper, newsprint, those types of uh documents that are really not meant for long-term uh, preservation. And so it would be a really good idea to maybe start with those so you can continue to have access. I um, mean, that digitization project of our records that Claire mentioned earlier, um, there were papers going back to the 1940s that were very brittle and um, were very difficult to read just because they are not meant to last that long. We've come a long way with technology, but, um, we have further to go. So thinking about when you know what you want to digitize, you're going to need to plan that project. And I'm not going to get into 
project planning or the real minutia of digitization. Just want you to know that there are a ton of resources available. We have, um, you know, last year's webinar series. We have uh, the DTMB Records Management Services website has a ton of this information already. So there are th places for you to go. Um, I just want to let you know that what I'm going to talk about is based off of that and that you should be not just jumping in to starting a project, but rather you should be planning your project, documenting your decisions, and then using that as a guide as you go through this process. Um, again, these uh, DTMB standards and best practices apply to digitization of public records from either paper or microfilm. These do not apply to born digital records. So emails, digital photography, you know, Word documents, those sorts of born digital materials. So this is only going from analog to digital. So uh, DTMB does have standards for this, but um, they are not incredibly strict. So you do have some flexibility. They do want you to pick an uncompressed or a losslessly compressed file format. Um, if you are replacing the original or using this as a replacement for the original. Um, this is really important for digital preservation as when you use a lossy compression file format, that information can be um, exponentially lost over time. So it's really important that you're using something that will um, remain whole, especially if it's a replacement for that paper document. Um, they do say that lossy compression is acceptable sometimes, um, but I wouldn't get in the habit of it and you would have to make a justification and it's just so much easier to be consistent with your file formats because as you eventually will have to migrate file formats at some point, um, you know, 10, 20 years in the future, it's ideal if you're working with the same file formats, you can manage things in bulk. Um, you know, so we're looking at uh, uncompressed TIFF files, JPEG 2000 files, or PDF files. Um, they do talk about resolution and require a minimum of 200 PPI or pixels per inch. Um, that is a minimum and that is uh, probably insufficient. Uh, if you do plan to do anything with optical character recognition or making transcripts of these, or you use drawings, they require a 300 PPI minimum. That is more like it. Um, that is going to be, cap uh, you know, it will be capable of um, running an optical character recognition. Um, they don't give recommendations on whether to do color or black and white or grayscale for these. Um, so the bitonal or black and white is going to take up a lot less space than those other formats, either grayscale or color. So that might be a huge um, space consideration for you when you're planning a document. Um, just if you have documents, I would highly recommend playing around with the settings and doing some test batches at varying resolutions so that you can see what's going to meet your needs but not widely exceed them because you want to find that sweet spot between enough information and not too much space or not too much storage. Um, and I can I can help you uh, run those tests if you need. Um, once you have them, your records digitized, you might be tempted to clean them up a little bit. Uh, Lord knows that when we get stuff back, especially a lot of the older documents that are really pulpy, um, you can get this kind of spectacular speckled effect. Um, you are welcome to do minor de-skewing, de-speckling, cropping, some minor adjustments, but um, what you can't do is actually alter the content that exists in that original record. So once records are digitized, it's likely that that is the only version the public will ever interact with, even if you don't destroy the originals. Um, that's why it's so important to make sure that not only the records are legible, but authentic, because we want to be authentic. We want to be transparent with our public so that they have faith in us as public servants. Um, now, again, this does not mean that you cannot redact information if you are making it publicly available. If it does happen to include PII, Claire talked a lot about the different types of PII, so I won't go into those. Um, but there are many tools that will um, search and redact information for you. Um, this is just a few of those, and I have links to other um, 
tools that uh, Cosla recommends. So that's in the resources section. Um, just something to think about is that when you are making these available online, if you are redacting information, this is for your forward facing documents, right? So this is for your access documents. You are not going to redact the uh, preservation version that you keep and because you still need access to that information as uh, as the record. Um, but think about if you're putting things online, um, if you're digitizing them and sharing them, those are going to be the redacted versions that are shared with the public. So just make sure that you're keeping these two file types separately. Um, Obviously, the goal of digitization is to ensure this access, but how you provide access and how much access you provide really will depend on um, your resources and the type of record. Uh, it's important to consider that everything or anything on a computer with an internet connection is open to access. So Claire talked about security. Um, so it's important that whether you intend or not, for this uh, material to be publicly available, you need to make sure that you're managing appropriate levels of access and that you're putting um, putting things in place to make sure that people don't have access to records that they shouldn't have access. Um, you know, and this can range from no access at all to freely available on the web and everything in between. It's just important that you make sure that you are clear about your decision, that you document that, and that you maintain whatever you decide. Um, there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all for every public document or any anything that you put on your site, really. It's going to be a decision based on, um, based on, on all of these factors. Um, so if you're digitizing public records as a replacement for the paper copy, you will need to have a digital preservation plan in place so that you can ensure the long-term accessibility and usability of these records. Um, you know, again, we think about digital as being forever once something's digitized. That is just not the case. Digital files are much less stable than paper or microfilm. They're dependent on hardware and software, which evolve very quickly. And because of this, you need to make sure that you have this plan in place. Um, Digital preservation does not mean having a backup. It doesn't say I emailed this to myself or I have it saved to the cloud so it's it's digitally preserved and that's efficient. It's not. Backups are a component of digital preservation, but digital preservation actually requires a set of managed activities over time to ensure that you can have access in the future. Um, you know, it does include having multiple files checking the validity of the files on a regular basis and likely the migration to new file formats in the future. Um, there's a webinar next month that Chelsea Denault for the Michigan Digital Preservation Network is doing on creating a digital preservation policy. So I would encourage you to attend that if you're not familiar with digital preservation. Um, now in an ideal world, you would have multiple copies of your digital objects. Um, you might be familiar with the acronym LOCKS L-O-C-K-S-S, lots of copies keeps stuff safe. Um, but how many copies is lots of copies? Three is kind of considered the minimum, five is better, seven is the gold standard. But based on your resources, that just might not be feasible. So we'd like to use the three, two, one rule uh, as a guide. Now the three, two, one rule states that you should have three copies of your files on two different storage media, with one of which being offsite. Now, having these three copies will enable you to restore files from a different storage location if something happens to one of the other copies of the files. Um, now, could something happen to all three of these? Yes, that is possible, but it's unlikely, um, depending on where and how they're stored. So this is why you want to have your um, copies of the files on two different storage media. So this is something like your server or some external hard drives or in the cloud, something so that if there's a natural disaster or if there's an actual disaster, you know, your building burns down, uh, you still have access to your files. Um, and it's important that one of these is offsite and the cloud counts as offsite because those servers are, uh, you know, geographically distributed. Um, just think about, oh, uh, you know, I have it, here on my local computer and I have it on our server and I have it on a flash drive so I'm fine I have three copies except if your building burns down or there's massive flooding and everything is destroyed then everything that was in that building 
even though you had three copies is um, it's not going to help you. So, you know, share with colleagues down the road, just, you know, find, find what works for you. But these steps are really all about reducing your risk, especially if you are legally responsible for these records over time and, and making things redundant in the best way. Um, if you want something a little bit more robust, you can explore the Michigan Digital Preservation Network. I mentioned that Chelsea is going to be doing a webinar in uh, a couple of weeks on digital preservation policies. I'll just mention briefly that this is something that the Library of Michigan um, supports, and it's a model of distributed digital preservation around the state. <coughs> Excuse me. We are running a little short on time, so I am going to just wrap up. Um, there are costs and benefits of digitization. I think that every decision for every organization is going to be different. You're clearly not going to digitize all of your public records, but I think that overall the costs of, of digitizing some records far outweigh, or the benefits far outweigh the costs. Um, especially when you can offset a lot of these costs with building it into your budget because it is an appropriate use of public funds, because you are facilitating FOIA requests, you can also charge people requesting if you need to um, for digitizing and providing access to these materials. All right, that's it. <laughs> and excuse me, got a tickle in my throat. Um, that was a lot. Luckily, you're going to copy the slides so that you can refer back to them. Um, as always, you should consult your library's attorney if you have questions about any of this. Um, but we are here to help. You know, consider accessibility, consider whether this is for access or preservation or replacement, and we can help you with that. So um, I know we're a little bit over, but Claire and I are happy to answer any questions you have. I see that I think she was answering some in the chat. Um, I wanted to mention that. Um... So for, at least from a legal perspective, um, be aware of unintended consequences. That's, you know, that's part of this whole critical thinking thing that um, I know Biz was talking about and, that, you know, I was talking about in terms of when you're, when you decide to do this, take a pause and a deep breath and consider all of the things around it. Um, because, you know, it, it, you may think, you know, oh, this is not a big deal, but you, you later on down the road, you may find out you know, uh oh, that vendor that I, you know, gave all our records to to, to process, um, you know, had a data breach, and now we're all liable under the Library Privacy Act. So, you know, depending on the record, so you know, it's important just to make sure that all your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed. Definitely. Aaron's asking, curious about recommendations for file formatting from a technical perspective. DFS, RAID, NAS for most long term storage, not trust expert or expert formatting on external drive for long term storage. Are there any awareness in library worlds regarding the integrity systems for long term storage? Yes. Um, so I would highly recommend RAID storage, if which creates additional redundancies. Um, you know, uh, external hard drives are something where you can use as an additional backup, but something that's more robust like a RAID drive um, would be preferable. Uh, that's why I highly recommend exploring the Michigan Digital Preservation Network because they are self-healing nodes distributed around the state. Um, and that is definitely more robust than anything you could do um, just kind of on your local setup. You may even also eventually write to tape which is, you know, like magnetic tape. They're talking about, you know, putting putting data in um, DNA for long-term yeah. preservation. Um, and there's a whole spiel I can get into about, um, you know, the environmental impacts of digital preservation. So considering what you use for digital preservation that can um, have long lasting effects on the environment, whether it's hard drives or servers, um, that is a topic for another day. <laughs> um, I want to mention about um, when you were talking about costs. Um, and uh, so we all know that FOIA, uh, you can charge for FOIA. But one of the things to consider is that the only way you're legally able to charge for FOIA is if you have a policy posted on your website. So if you make sure that you have that FOIA policy posted on your website. 
Okay. Well, um, thank you all for joining. I do just want to drop in the link for um, how to pick your policy, creating digital preservation policy that's going to happen in April. So please feel free to register and join us for that. I'll be joined by uh, Dr. Chelsea Denault from the Michigan Digital Preservation Network. And you know, we'll continue to stick around, but we really appreciate you joining us today and um, considering digitizing your material. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank IMLS for making this presentation possible. And I'd also like to drop in the chat um, just a brief survey. It's only four questions about uh, the webinar and the content that we provide because it really helps us with our, mm -hmm. um, you know, plan our, our um presentations and our educational and training resources. So we appreciate you being here. We appreciate your feedback and thank you so much.